And as I read it, I this is this is the explicit instruction of this camp. I went walking. What did you see? And I read the whole book again and again and again with the idea that if it, if it's the child's exposed enough, they will internalize the sound symbol relationships and be able to see the words and visualize the words and they'll do it when they're ready to do it. And it's absolutely the wrong approach. Now this this is hardcore and there are there are classrooms in this country that are still adhering to this. Um, but now with almost as dangerous, this is a whole language approach. And um, more dangerous now is something called bound. I think it's more dangerous because whole language has such a bad name now. Um, but it's balanced literacy. So the balanced literacy, uh, which is really whole language proponents, saying we will give five minutes to direct instruction of reading and we'll spend 45 minutes reading for meaning and writing poetry and being creative. Um, there's that element that's out there now too. So I really believe strongly in the, from K through three that we have to be really solid with the awareness, we have to be really solid with phonics, get that automaticity down and start working towards fluency in third grade. And once we get the kids fluent, that's not to say we're not working on vocabulary, that we're not reading rich literature in class and discussing it. But until, and that we're not, we're not having, this isn't for all kids, right? So you're having, you, this is the challenge of an administrator. I don't want Billy to spend a minute longer in phonics than he has to, right? As soon as he has his phonics down, I want him moving right into connected text. So I have to have, I have to be able to schedule reading groups in the building that match kids where they are and not force not force them into groups they don't belong in. And that's true for the, the struggling reader who needs more time in phonemic awareness and phonics. It's equally true for the gifted reader who needs to who can push through quickly because they're getting really good instruction. They're moving through groups rapidly and they're in the comprehension group before you know it. In the vocabulary group, and they're once you master it's like riding a bike. Once you once you master fluency, you don't work on fluency. Anymore. You're, you're reading and you're becoming just in the very nature of reading, you're becoming more fluent. So, you know, we don't want to put kids where they're not, but it takes a creative administration to figure out how they're going to schedule, and how they're going to create reading groups. So, that direct instruction needs to start as early as kindergarten through building from the Any other questions? I was curious with the names of the two new programs you adopted last year. They're both uh, under the Wilson umbrella. Wilson is evidence-based. Um, it's got 25 plus years of, of research behind it. The two Wilson programs one is for the youngest students, it's called Foundations, and we use that for, well, you would use it for kindergarten, first and second grade. And then we started another word study through Wilson, uh, more aimed at upper elementary, middle school, and into high school, and that's called Just Words. Uh, two very, very good programs. Um, that, and again, Ellen's absolutely correct, the, curric it's, the curriculum isn't enough. You have to have the training teachers behind it. So when you're saying you're, every Friday you guys do the fluency test on every student, is that something that just started in last year, or is that something you guys have been doing longer? No, it just it started actually um, a year ago, say April. I wanted the teachers to use it for a few weeks before we started in earnest in September of last year. Okay. So I just gave them six weeks to practice using it, and then in September last year we launched into it. Now, if you're a Groves parent, um, we haven't started it yet because we just finished up our reading groups and so forth. So by the end of September, early October, we will have, we will have started the fluency progress monitoring. Well, we also have, we have Wilson Reading Group for the new students. They have to get into a routine. If, you know, they have to, they're moving through the process. We don't want to jump through hoops. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah at grade level by third grade, they have a 25% chance of catching up. 
Do you think the strategies you're using here yeah. will increase that? Yeah, those graphs. Yeah, those graphs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's what it is, right? If those kids are half of the, you know, they're making a half a year of progress when they're coming in here, mm -hmm. there's no well, there's no light switch in fifth grade that's going to all of a sudden bring them up because we're not teaching reading anymore. You're in the content area now. You're using reading to, to learn about a subject matter. So there's no more reading instruction. There's, no, there's nothing. The, the, kid, the 25 percent of kids who do catch up are those that are lucky enough to go to Groves or school like Groves or who are getting really good to it. I mean, that, that's it. I mean, it's just, it, it is just so damning that we wait so long to identify kids. And we don't know, you know, by the start of third grade whether it's a neurological problem or it's an instructional problem. Yeah. Well, let's clear up that issue by giving them good instruction so we know those kids in that RTI model who aren't responding in end of first grade, early second grade, we're giving them that instruction right then instead of waiting until fourth or fifth or sixth grade. Mm -hmm. That's why that RTI model is so powerful. You don't have to wait for all the testing. You don't have to wait for the referral from the teacher who believes the light bulb is going to go on in fifth grade. It's happening all the time. But it, you have to be getting that data. You have to mine that data consistently to see if, in fact, that child's behind. Does um, the Wilson program have uh, a financial component to it? Yes. yes. Especially in the fund, it does. In the fund, and Ellen can speak more specifically. Yeah. To uh, that. Uh, there's the Wilson Reading System, which is the, the, the flagship program. Uh, foundations and Just Words are based, are based on that. Yes, they all have very strong uh, phonemic awareness um, and phonological coding components. Okay. Yeah, I'll just put a plug in to uh, that. Rose is a, a licensed partner of Wilson, and we conduct teacher training here. And Ellen does it. We're hoping to have another teacher trainer trained here soon. And we, we work with public. Most of it is, is teachers who are taking their own initiative and coming. But what we really like to do is we work with entire schools and see. My, my dream is if we can work with enough individual schools and get the same kind of results that I'm showing you here that we're getting, that at some point there'll be a, there's a tipping point out there sometimes, right? So that if we're working with eight disadvantaged schools and we're getting the kind of results that we know we can get, then maybe somebody, maybe the light will go on some administrator's head that there is better instruction out there for kids than what they're currently using. Yep. Um. Briefly, I heard that the only state in our nation is Texas that does provide free services for dyslexia early on, and why did Texas become so good? It's probably because I know that Texas, um, I don't know the law there, but I do know that they're not afraid to call a dyslexic a dyslexic, and that they do believe in identifying early. It's probably because they have a very strong grassroots movement there. Mm -hmm. Let's put pressure on the legislature like we did here. How much reading method or teaching method did you guys use before the Wilson? We've used Wilson since I've been here. Okay. But we're using it with more fidelity and okay. we're training our teachers in, in a more a deeper way. And, and Wilson's really a derivative of the, the, the mothership of um, of real structured reading instruction called Orton Gillingham. And some of you may have heard of that. And I'll editorialize on that only that in our public school, the special ed people were Orton Gillingham. But then I found out that there's actually different levels of Orton Gillingham, not like right. at a master level. And my kid was not responding because the teacher was not effective. Which brings me to another another point that I make to people all the time, which is don't be afraid to ask what the qualifications of the learning specialist or special ed teacher or whatever has, because there are four levels of Wharton Gillingham. 
and people say, well, I've, you know, I've been trained in Orton Hills. I've had a number of kids come here uh, to be in, in my summer Wilson Reading System Training pro Certification Program who came from, you know, uh, very well-respected schools. And they had learning specialists who, who supposedly get Orton Gillingham but the kids were not making progress. You need a very qualified teacher, and then you also need uh, to know that that teacher has instituted some kind of progress monitoring to determine has the child really made progress. Mm -hmm. Show you know, show me the money. Show me the progress. Mm -hmm. I want to see it in black and white. And I think you know, I think I think as parents. Um, you know, you could do you do well to really question those. You know, and ask questions about with that. that too. It's not just saying, "Oh, I've had Warren Gillingham," but exactly. they've also no, done I mean, it over a few times. there are people who say, too. "Oh, yeah, I teach Wilson," but yeah. they, you know, maybe they've had a three-day workshop, right, or maybe right, they just right. use the materials. Yeah. You know, yeah. that you want something that's that's, uh, you know. You should be able to ask for a resume of a tutor. You should be able to ask for certification or, yeah. you know, and real credentials. So that's uh, all I have right now. Pretty strong bias too. If I had it my way, I would, I would not hire. And this is how strongly I feel about higher education in terms of preparing teachers to teach. I would rather not hire somebody out of a school of education. I'd much rather hire uh, a really strong liberal arts kid coming out with BA in history and who has no preconceived notions of how to teach a reading um, and train them up with a clean slate. And because I think that's how much damage is done in schools of higher ed in terms of preparing teachers to teach reading. In fact, the school that I started at um, was a, it was an independent school didn't take any state money, and that he wouldn't hire teachers. He wouldn't hire people with teaching licenses. He would just hire liberal arts majors, Kid, who had strong experiences with kids as camp counselors, as uh, tennis coaches, as whatever, big brothers, big sisters. So that relationship with kids was there, and then he trained them, trained them hard. And you know, I think we were far more effective teachers because of that. Thank you for coming tonight, and uh, come, come back. Yeah.